So welcome to the central heating and cooling plant at UC Davis. This is, uh, this is kind of like the heart of the campus in some ways. It's, it's got a lot going on here and uh, that's why it's called the central heating and cooling plant. Um, everything happens here and then gets distributed out to the campus. But it does heating and cooling, so it's both district heating and district cooling. So the reason we have this, this whole central heating and cooling plant, there's a couple reasons. One is that it's more efficient to have large equipment like this. You can get a 400 horsepower pump at a much higher efficiency point than if you had a lot of small pumps. Same thing for the cooling and heating systems. The larger ones uh, can be more efficient. But, but one of the bigger reasons is that when you have everything in one place, there's a lot of opportunities there. Okay, now we're down in the uh, belly of the plant here. And if you guys come over this way, these pipes here on my left are where the steam all goes out to the campus and the condensate comes back. So that's for the district heating system. So the, the hot steam is going out to do the heating on the campus. And then once it's cooled off, it's turned into hot water, it comes back into the plant. We'll spend more time on this system later. Um, but when it comes back in here, it goes into a concrete tank right over here on my right. And this collects here and then it gets pumped upstairs um, into the steam system to get turned back into steam. Now we're in the steam plant where the, the heating is produced and uh, then gets sent over to those steam pipes that go out to the campus. So this is called the deaerator tank. This is where all that condensate that comes back from the campus ends up in this tank so that we can reuse it. And if we need to add more water to the system because of losses in the system, it gets added here as makeup water and it maintains a certain level in this tank. Um, they inject low pressure steam into the tank to get rid of oxygen so that you don't have oxygen absorbed in the water when it goes into the boilers, which would cause oxygenation or rust. Um, so this, it, this has the temperature about uh, 230 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a little bit over atmospheric pressure. And then it goes down below us to some feed water pumps, which are down low so that they can keep some head pressure on them so that they don't cavitate because at that temperature it's very close to boiling and without that extra head, head pressure the pump the water might start boiling the pump which would destroy the pump so with the pumps down there they're able to pump that really hot water up into the boiler there's the temperature if you want to show them we're going to go take a look at the boiler now and see what's going on in there All right, so this is the boiler that's running right now. This is boiler four. It's capable of producing 150,000 pounds per hour of steam. Um, right now, it's, it's not going to be running at, at anywhere close to that. It's probably about half of that um, because it's a warmer day. But it's meeting all the campus heating load right now. So the way these boilers work is they have, the, well, the other end is a, a gas burner. It has natural gas mixing with air for the fire. And that flame comes down the length of the boiler toward us. And the box here, inside of it, it's, it's, got, it's surrounded by water tubes, tubes full of water. Um, and in those water, in those water tubes, the, the water is boiling and creating steam from that flame in the middle of them. So, um, the steam rises up to the top. There's a drum at the top called a steam drum. And you guys can look inside and see that flame coming down the middle of the boiler, making the steam, creating the steam. Um, it's not too different than a, a water heater, except that it's actually boiling the steam instead of just heating it. So if you can look in here, you can actually see the flame. I'm gonna say, look in this middle one. That The operators have these little portals to be able to see the flame um, and that's a, about a 30 foot flame coming towards you at 11 or 1200 degrees. Um, they can they can actually see if the flame looks like it's, it's uh, the burners are all working right. They can also inspect it here to see if there's any leaks in the water tube. So the boiler itself is actually very efficient. Uh, we'll, we'll talk some more about its efficiency, but, but overall its thermal efficiency is about 
in the mid 80s, 85 percent. Um, it's also very clean, and th this exhaust train over here has a catalytic converter and an ammonia injection section to clean up the exhaust so that going out the knock, the, the uh, pollutants are very low. So it's about five ppm knocks, which is as clean a boiler as you can possibly get. Um, it's well below the current rig and any future rigs that are coming out because we knew this was, might be here for a while, so we wanted to have a boiler that would work uh, in terms of the, the air, air pollution requirements. So a very clean burning boiler. It's just that the steam distribution system is where you have a lot of efficiency loss. So this is the burner end of the boiler. We have here natural gas coming in the bottom in these pipes, and it mixes in the burner box with the air that's coming in from a fan right above my head. It's sucking air in and, and blowing it in to mix with the fuel so you can get a really good combustion in that flame you just saw. And this is the uh, control. Uh, even if the, the control screens you saw didn't work for the operators, they can come out here and run the, run the boiler off these control screens. So we're outside the, the steam plant now because I want to show you guys what's up on the roof. And uh, you can see on the roof of the steam plant is an exhaust stack. That cylinder going vertically is the exhaust of this boiler that's running right now. But the pipe that comes off the side of it is actually where the exhaust is going because we installed a condensing economizer. That's a, a piece of equipment that helps this boiler run even more efficiently. And it's taking that exhaust, instead of going out into the atmosphere right here at about 250 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, it's taking that exhaust over to the building next door where it goes through a condensing economizer, which basically just means something that extracts as much heat out of that exhaust as possible so that it can use it. Um, it the reason we could put that in is we were able to use that heat in the dorms next door. So the residence hall in Tercero, um, they're the, all the new halls there are heated by the exhaust of this boiler. It, the exhaust goes into this big heat exchanger. Um, it heats several other water streams in the plant, like the makeup water and the condensate return as well, it preheats them. Um, but it also heats the heating water that goes over to the Tercero residence halls and feeds, uh, I think there's, we're up to 12 buildings and the dining commons, they're all heated by the exhaust of this boiler. Um, you can do that because of that heat of vaporization. Uh, as you, there's a lot, of, a lot of heat in the exhaust and if you cool it down enough to where you can condense the combustion uh, liquid out of the exhaust, you can actually get a lot of heat out of that exhaust. So um, we're able to heat all those dorm buildings. The, that's for their, their heating plus their hot water, um, showers, things like that. Also the dining commons heating is all done from the exhaust of this plant. So one way to look at that is without doing that heating, this boiler would be less efficient. Now that we're using that exhaust heat, we're making it useful. That boiler efficiency goes from about 85% to above 90%. Um, so it makes the whole boiler plant more efficient. And we were able to do all that heating without adding any extra steam capacity to the plant uh, because they're just using the exhaust of the plant. Um, so over here, I'm going to show you real quick the chilled water pumps. If you've never seen a pump, this is what a centrifugal pump looks like. Um, this is a really big pump, maybe the biggest you'll ever see. It's a 400 horsepower pump. There's three of them here. And it's a centrifugal pump, meaning this, this motor turns a shaft, which turns a pump inside the, uh, the casing here. And there's, a, there's an impeller that moves the water, spins the water, and with a centrifugal force, creates a pressure differential between the inlet and the outlet. So the water's coming in one side and going out the other, and it gives it enough pressure to push it through the entire campus. Um, so it's a 400 horsepower pump, which is really big, but it also can run at variable speed. So it only needs to pump the water that we actually want to pump out to the campus. The way it does that is with a variable frequency drive or a VFD, which you can see over here. This is a VFD cabinet and uh, there's a, a couple other parts to it. There's a bypass 
Here's another VFD for the next pump, and there's other ones over there. What these do is they vary the frequency. So the normal frequency of the electrical system here, frequency is, is in hertz or cycles per second, and it's normally 60, but this can vary the frequency um, so that the pump will slow down. So it, it varies the frequency of the, um, of the motor. So in, if you're running at 30 hertz, it'll be at 50% speed instead of 100% speed. And that allows you to vary the frequency and the speed of the pump without losing efficiency. These huge pipes here are the chill water system. Um, they're coming from the chiller plant, which we'll get to later. Um, over here, they run through the chill water pumps upstairs, and then they go out to the campus here and come back in. Um, this, this has enough uh, cooling capacity, basically, to, to do all the cooling on the campus um, for the most, most of the year. But right now we have another plant that's doing the cooling and this one's gonna turn on in the summer. So we, we use this sort of as our base load plant and we do uh, the cooling during the summer with, with this plant and use our other plant as the year round plant. Um, the other one, the reason is the other one has a thermal energy storage tank, which gives us a lot more flexibility about how we operate it and also gives us some benefits in terms of efficiency. So this is kind of the last step in the campus district cooling system, we take the chilled water, you remember seeing those pumps that push the water out to the campus. Um, they go into each building and the, the, chilled, the chilled water goes into each building and cools the air in the buildings down and then comes back to the plant warmer. So like I said, it goes out at 40 degrees, comes back at 50 to 60 degrees. Um, in the chillers, which we'll see next, that heat gets moved into the condenser water which is in these green pipes and then that that warm water can get uh, dumped into these cooling towers where the heat can get rejected to the atmosphere so it's taking the heat from the students in the buildings from the the, the processes in the buildings um, as it cools those buildings down and it's throwing it into the atmosphere here um, and that warm air with the cooling towers running a evaporation cycle will make a cloud in the in the summer when there's cool air outside. Um, but again, it's just warm, moist air hitting the cooler air and making a, a cloud of condensation. Um, so these are a very low energy way to get rid of heat. But what we're gonna try to do is to, or what we are gonna do now with the hot water system is instead of throwing away heat here, we can just put that heat directly into a hot water system and use it. So let's look at the chillers and we'll talk about how to do that. So we're in the chiller plant now. There's four large chillers. They're all made by a train. And they're called centrifugal chillers, like a centrifugal pump. They use a, a centrifugal compressor. Um, you can see up on the top of the chillers, there's two pump looking devices. Those are the compressors. And um, instead of pumping water, they're pumping refrigerant. So let me explain to you how a chiller works. And these chillers have uh, two barrels or two sides to it. One is the evaporator and one is the condenser. It works basically like an air conditioner. Um, so this is the same type of process you'd have at your home air conditioner, where you have one side of it cooling air in your house and then the other side of it getting rid of that, that heat outside. Um, in this case though, instead of cooling air and getting rid of heat outside to the air, we're cooling water and we're getting rid of the heat to water. The reason is water has a higher specific heat than, than air and it can actually do that much, that heat transfer much more efficiently. It can carry the heat away uh, much more efficiently. So this type of system is a more efficient way to do air conditioning than an air cooled air conditioner like you have at your house. Um, the chilled water from the campus comes in here at 50 degrees and it runs through a lot of little tubes down the whole length of this chiller. On the outside of the tubes is refrigerant. It's liquid refrigerant and as it comes in contact with the 50 degree water, that's warmer than the refrigerant and it evaporates the refrigerant so that the refrigerant turns into a vapor. Um, and, and that in that evaporation process, it picks up heat from the water. So the heat gets transferred from the water to the refrigerant 
Then the refrigerant gas goes into the compressors because now you can compress it to a high temperature. And then you dump the gas into this side, which is the condenser side, where it can condense that back to a liquid by giving its heat to one more water stream, which is the condenser water in those green pipes that takes the heat out to the cooling tower. So the refrigerant's getting pumped around in the refrigerant cycle here. When it comes into here, before it comes into this, it goes through a expansion valve, which makes it go to low pressure so it can evaporate again. And it gets compressed, condensed, expanded and evaporated. So it goes through that refrigeration cycle and it just moves heat from the chilled water to the condenser water. Now, it can do that very efficiently because all it's doing is moving heat from one thing to another. With our boilers, I talked about how we get them up just above 90% efficiency, which is very efficient for a boiler. That means that 90% of the energy coming in in the gas can be used on the steam side. Um, and, and you can't ever get more than 100% efficiency because you can only use the energy that's coming into it. In this case, we're actually just moving energy. We're not generating anything. So we're, we're moving the energy from the one water stream to another. And we're doing that with the compressors. And those compressors take a lot of energy to run. Like I said, it's a megawatt to run one of these chillers. But they can move the equivalent of about three megawatts of cooling. So. Uh, your, your coefficient of performance in terms of how much you get out or how much energy you can move versus how much it takes to move it is about three. But if you could actually use the heat on this side, now suddenly your useful energy went from three to, which is the cooling side, to now whatever you can use on this side, which is three plus the heat that you get out of the, the compressors as well. So with just using a little bit more energy to run them, because you have to bump it up to a little bit higher temperature, you can use all this energy, which is, let's say four to keep it simple, plus three over there with just a little bit more than one to run the whole thing. So you have seven uh, useful units of energy when you add heating and cooling in, with only about one to drive the whole thing. So your coefficient of performance went from three to seven. So it's, you know, in terms of efficiency, it's like having a 300% efficiency chiller now going to a 700% efficiency heat pump because you're using only one energy to get seven useful units of energy on cooling and heating side. So that's really the big reason we want to go to hot water is so our whole campus efficiency can be so much better um, when we can combine the heating and cooling systems together. And that's one of the big values about having a central heating and cooling plant is to be able to tie those two district systems together, uh, which you can do when you have some storage. So that's a lot of information. Any questions?